Getting the exposure to grow your small wedding business can be difficult. With millions of engaged couples using The Knot to plan their weddings and find vendors, advertising on our sites will connect you with more couples than anywhere else online. Meet engaged couples where they're already searching for vendors like you. And let us deliver leads to help you grow your business. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast to sign up today. Mention code PODCAST15 during your free onboarding session for 15% off your first month. Hello everyone, Ray here. So, a few weeks ago, I was contacted by Caleb Walker, who has a new podcast, Lifestyles. That's life with a Y. Caleb is a young man who is trying to figure out life, and his podcast reflects that. As his podcast has a very open format, he asked if we could talk about the Aleutian campaign of World War II, as it started relatively soon after Pearl Harbor and can be treated as a standalone subject, I said yes, and we had a nice conversation about it. And since I had done all that reading, well, here's the Aleutian campaign. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II Podcast, Episode 243, The Aleutian Islands Campaign. Deep in the basement, in the old administration building, or number one building, at the Pearl Harbor Navy shipyard, just south of Battleship Row, there was a room that very few people were allowed to enter. This was Station Hypo, otherwise known as Fleet Radio Unit Pacific. Hypo was the U.S. Navy Signal's monitoring and cryptographic intelligence unit. The cryptanalysts that worked in the basement were called Crippies, and it was their job to take the 500 to 1,000 messages that came in each day from the various listening posts, stationed in places like Guam, Indochina, Thailand, Wake Island, Hong Kong, Manila, Singapore, Malaya, Java, and Burma, and try to glean useful information from what parts of those messages could be deciphered. The man in charge of this setup for naval intelligence was Lieutenant Commander Joseph J. Rochford. Rochford had spent three years in Japan learning the language, and now it was his job to listen in on Japanese naval military signals, as well as to identify strategic targets within Japan's electrical power network just in case war broke out between the two countries, which is exactly what the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor brought about. The man whose job it was now to halt further Japanese expansion until the U.S. Navy could make good its losses at Pearl Harbor was Admiral Chester W. Nimitz. As chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, he was to somehow use the remainder of his force three operational battleships, and three carriers to cover the vast Pacific Ocean. A tall order, which is why the Japanese Empire was able to go on and take Guam, Indochina, parts of modern-day Laos and Vietnam, Thailand, Wake Island, Hong Kong, Manila, Singapore, Malaya, Java, and Burma, modern-day Miramar. Still, Nimitz was looking for his opportunity. If the Crippies could deliver a solid lead, the Admiral would be able to concentrate his reduced force and, hopefully, give the enemy a bloody nose. Anything to stop their rampaging over the Southeast Pacific. But Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto, the Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet, and the mastermind behind the Pearl Harbor raid, wasn't done yet. By May of 1942, he knew that his window of opportunity, the comparative strength of the Japanese fleet versus that of the United States, was closing fast. But the Admiral had two ongoing objectives that conveniently dovetailed for him. First, he needed to take as much territory as he could that held resources that the main Japanese islands did not possess and he needed to draw out the U.S. naval fleet in its current state so it could be annihilated. If this could be brought about, then the Empire would not have mere months to strengthen their hold in Asia, but years. 
Of course, the proactive Nimitz wanted to do the same thing to the Japanese. Find out the whereabouts of their next strike, concentrate his forces, and wipe out the Japanese Navy. Then time would no longer be the enemy of the United States Navy. Getting back to Station Hypo, on May 14, 1942, Lieutenant Commander Rochford was brought a message that seemed to indicate that Yamamoto's next target was Midway, a small group of islands, a possession of the U.S., about 3,400 miles, or 5,471 kilometers, northwest of Oahu, almost exactly the midway point between North America and Asia hence its name. As much confirmation as was possible was done, so then the information was sent to Admiral Nimitz. However, this was just one prediction, though backed up by some evidence that was hitting the Admiral's desk in mid-May. The Australians were howling that they were Japan's next target, while the U.S. Army was saying San Francisco would be the next one to see the troops of the Japanese Empire. As for Nimitz, he decided to go with his crippies, certainly after a follow-up message from Admiral Yamamoto himself was deciphered that explained the details of the coming attack on Midway. By May 25, 1942, Nimitz knew that not only was the enemy going to attack and occupy Midway, but they were going to, hopefully, avoid the bulk of the U.S. Navy by staging a diversionary attack on the Aleutian Islands. The Aleutians are a 1,000-mile or 1,600-kilometer-long chain of volcanic islands that extends from the tip of the Alaskan Peninsula to the Russian Komodorsky Islands and are about 2,300 miles or 3,700 kilometers north of Pearl Harbor. Yamamoto's plan was to bomb the most significant installation along the Aleutians, Dutch Harbor, located on the far eastern end of the island chain, just off the Alaskan Peninsula. Dutch Harbor is a part of the Amatnak Island, which itself is surrounded by the larger Unalaska Island. Situated at Dutch Harbor was Fort Mears Army Base, as well as a naval operating base. The Japanese plan called for a bombing of Dutch Harbor, which would draw the U.S. Navy back east and to the north. Then Midway would be attacked. However, before the U.S. could realize its mistake and sail west, the Japanese would then attack and occupy two islands on the western end of the Aleutians, Atu and Kiska. This would force the U.S. vessels to choose which target was more important, their naval station, sub-base, refueling center, and airstrip at Midway, or the American soil of the Aleutians. And, if things worked out properly for the Japanese, they would have the Americans sailing in many different directions, accomplishing nothing, and wasting massive amounts of fuel to boot. Alas, Admiral Nimitz knew what his opponents were thinking, but his situation was still an unsettling one. As he did not have the forces at hand, one of these targets was going to get short shrift in terms of defense. Who was it to be? For Nimitz, the answer, with the Crippy's information in front of him, was obvious. Yes, the Aleutians were going to be harassed, but Midway was going to be occupied. That could not be allowed to happen. So, gathering his carrier force, they and their escorts were sent to Midway. As for up north, Rear Admiral Robert A. Theobald would be given a much smaller fleet and told to defend the Aleutians. However, Admiral Robert Fuzzy Theobald had his own interpretation of the Crippy's analysis. To his way of thinking, Yamamoto the master of Pearl Harbor, was attempting a double bluff. The intercepted plans were just a ruse to get the U.S. naval ships to the western end of the Aleutians so they could be cut off from help and destroyed. The enemy's true first priority, according to Theobald, 
was the island just east of Unalaska, Umnak Island. Umnak housed the Army airfields Fort Glenn and Fort Randall. Once they were occupied, only then would the Japanese go after Dutch Harbor. But even this was just a stepping stone to other territory further to the east that was to be taken, and if successful, then the entire west coast of the United States would be open to attack. And just like that, Theobald's fleet went from deflecting a diversionary attack to safeguarding the entire west coast, which could lead one to think that the rear admiral's ego was involved with his interpretation of Nimitz's information. Either way, Theobald ordered his fleet to station itself in order to ambush the Japanese fleet some 1,000 miles or 1,600 kilometers to the east of Dutch Harbor. That way, the west coast would be protected, but not the Aleutian Islands. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Back as early as 1940, as tension had been mounting between the United States and the Empire of Japan, the U.S. Navy had begun to build a naval base at Amanak Island within a bay of the much larger Unalaska Island. The U.S. Army first landed troops there in June of 1941 to protect the growing naval base, while that was finished by September of 1941. Soon after Fort Mears located south of the naval base, housed the troops that manned the coastal defenses. So, with Rear Admiral Theobald's fleet too far to the east to interfere, two Japanese carriers, the Ryujo and Junyo, came within 180 miles, or 290 kilometers, southwest of Dutch Harbor, along with their escorts. On June 3, 1942, at 2.58 a.m., the two carriers launched their 12 Zero Fighters, 10 Kate high-level bombers, and 12 Val dive bombers. At 4.07 a.m., their air attack commenced on Dutch Harbor. The men of the 206 Coast Artillery, Arkansas National Guard, awoke to bombs exploding and machine guns going off. Although on alert for an attack, nothing specific had been told to the men. Still, once they realized the situation, the troops ran for their guns. Some of the men even used their own rifles to shoot at the low-flying planes. The raid was over in minutes. When the Japanese aircraft left, 26 Americans were dead, as bombs had landed on barracks 864 and 866 at Fort Mears. Every Japanese plane made it back to their carrier safely. The American installation had 30 fighters, but by the time they got up in the air, the enemy was gone. Still, the fighters were sent out to find the enemy's fleet, but that remained hidden. 
During the evening and night of June 3rd, the U.S. soldiers climbed down from the mountaintops with their guns. It was hoped that if the Japanese came back the next morning, they would bomb these areas again in the weak pre-dawn light and waste their ordnance. Instead, the soldiers would be circled around the harbor facilities themselves, not only to protect it from another air attack, but to defend it from the expected ground invasion. The attackers did indeed return the next day, June 4th, but not during the morning. Rear Admiral Kakuji Kakuta would never do something so predictable. Rather, he spent the night of June 3rd moving his fleet even closer to within 100 miles or 160 kilometers of the Americans' position. Only in the afternoon at 4 p.m. did the second air attack commence. This time, nine fighters, 11 dive bombers, and six high-level bombers would be involved. The Zeros spent their time strafing the anti-air batteries, while the bombers did further damage to the barracks, oil storage tanks, the hangar, some parked aircraft, and a few merchant ships in port. The transport ship, Northwestern, was damaged, but its power plant was saved and used to produce electricity for shore installations. Four more U.S. Naval servicemen were also killed. But this time, the ground guns did damage two dive bombers and a fighter, enough so that they would not make it back to the fleet. As for the fighters stationed at Dutch Harbor, some had been patrolling overhead. They did little to stop the attack, but once the Japanese were on their way back to their carriers, the six Curtis P-40 fighters on station engaged the enemy. The Americans took out one more fighter and two more high-level bombers. In exchange, the Americans lost two of their aircraft. With the second air raid over, Admiral Kakuta was ordered to break off and rejoin the combined fleet, which had suffered greatly at the Battle of Midway, which will be covered in the future. The land invasion never came to Dutch Harbor. The Americans believed they had repelled this attack. But they would soon discover the enemy had other plans for their infantry. Back in May, with the Japanese trying to convince the U.S. that the Aleutian campaign was the real thing, even having Tokyo Rose, an English-speaking broadcaster of Japanese propaganda, say, a two we are coming. The U.S. Navy tried to evacuate the islands there, on the far western end of the island chain. However, the Willowas, the intense storms and hurricane force winds that resulted when the cold air from the Arctic met the warm air of the Pacific, prevented this. Still, the Navy told the islanders, via radio, to keep their belongings packed. They would return. So, when a large ship lay anchor outside Chicago Harbor on the northeastern corner of Attu on the morning of June 7, 1942, the locals assumed and hoped it was the Americans. However, the vessel, it could barely be seen through the thick fog, was not flying a flag. Eventually, a flag was raised, a rising red sun on a white background. Most of the village was just coming out of church as Japanese infantry units started walking towards them. One group of 20 soldiers, of very young men, started shooting at the buildings and the people. The wife of the local chief, Anne Hodakoff, was hit in the leg. But before anyone else could be hurt, a second unit of older men came along and told them to stop. The villagers knew their situation was desperate. But these people were made of hardy stuff to live in such a rough climate, so the men wanted to grab their weapons and fight back. But Chief Hodakov knew it would be suicide. He told his people, do not shoot. Maybe the Americans can save us yet. When the Japanese troops had first been spotted coming over a hill, Foster Jones, who was sitting near his cabin next to the schoolhouse, ran inside to where his two-way radio was kept. 
Foster and his wife, Etta, worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. She was a schoolteacher and nurse. Foster radioed the weather to Dutch Harbor four times a day. He was also charged with sending a message if any Japanese ships were spotted. Foster got to work reporting that the Japanese had landed on a two, while Etta burned all their letters and notes. Only after this was done did the couple go outside and give themselves to the Japanese troops. The islanders were all herded into the community's schoolhouse. The natives were told they were now free of American tyranny. The Japanese officers took possession of the Jones's cabin. The next day, Foster Jones was taken away from the group. The Japanese believed he was an American spy, but one that also worked for the hated Russians. A few hours later, the guards came to collect Etta. She was taken back to her home. But when she entered, she saw her husband dead on the floor. The Japanese interpreter explained to Etta that her husband had cut his own wrists with his pocket knife and bled to death. The woman, though in shock, did not believe this, but was too stunned to make a comment. A few days later, Etta Jones was put aboard a Japanese ship, and she would never set foot on Atu again. Postscript. Seeing her husband on the floor, Etta Jones thought she would go insane. Yet by the time the transport ship left the island, and on its way to Yokohama, just south of Tokyo, she was firmly in charge of her faculties. After arriving on June 21, 1942, she was interrogated by the Japanese, but they convinced themselves that she knew nothing of military value. Etta was soon joined by 18 Australian nurses, captured in New Guinea. The women were not forced to work, but were moved around several times outside of Yokohama. Etta and the nurses, with nothing to do, started knitting small silk bags for the enemy soldiers to put their religious pictures in, and were paid for this. In 1944, they started receiving American Red Cross boxes. Nothing was sent specifically to Etta, as no one in America knew of her location. Not until July 3, 1945, were the Red Cross representatives allowed to visit the prisoners, and it was then that they were told the war was almost over. On September 1, 1945, Mrs. Jones was flown back to the United States. Waiting for her was a check for $7,371, the equivalent of $100,000 today back pay from the Bureau of Indian Affairs for her teaching position.